So we're rolling right over into um, an interview that I've actually been looking forward to. Um, we're joined by Lucy Flores. Uh, she is a candidate for Congress out of Nevada, and I believe the district is um, – what is the district? The 4th District? Man, my, my mind escapes me. I, I, I had it right here. But anyway, I'll let her introduce herself. Lucy, um, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm wonderful. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, what, what district are you running in in Nevada? It's Congressional District 4. Or I was right. Okay, I thought I, had, <laughs> I didn't see it on my notes, and I just I, I knew I read it earlier. I, I want to start. Um, I want you to start by telling us about yourself. I um, there is a lot of great things about you that I've read. Um, CNN um, said that you are one of nine politicians to watch. Um, you are an assembly woman. You're an attorney. Uh, but I like this quote that I found online about you was they said that Flores has been a darling in liberal circles for years. And her personal story, abandoned by her mother as a child, joined a gang, dropped out of school and overcame it all, is certainly moving. Um, before I even go too much further, I want you to just speak to who you are and how did you get to this spot in your journey? Well, it's definitely a, a long story that I've managed to condense in a very short amount of time. <laughs> but let me first say that I'm a former assemblywoman. You know, obviously you retain the title, et cetera. But um, I actually ran for lieutenant governor last year here in Nevada. In order to do that, I uh, had to run for one or the other. So I'm not actively serving right now. So I just wanted to clear that up very quickly. But um, yeah, it's been a very long journey. I uh, first moved to Las Vegas when I was two years old. And, and really, it's kind of been almost a series of tragedy in my life. We moved to Las Vegas, my dad and um, my entire family, those of us who were under 18, um, because of a family tragedy. My two oldest brothers were murdered because of drug and gang violence in East LA. So my dad just kind of took us all and brought us to Las Vegas to try to start a new, um, you know, low-income immigrant family. My dad's from Mexico. We struggled very much, but in very much like a lot of low-income families in this country, we made do. It wasn't until my mom left my family when I was nine that I really started to experience a lot of problems and challenges. And even though I was in gifted and talented education in school, um, there wasn't a safety net for me. I fell through the cracks. My dad was literally working day and night to keep us clothed and fed. And uh, things went from bad to worse. I got involved in the wrong crowd because that's essentially all that was there for me. I ended up on juvenile parole at 15 and I ended up dropping out of high school at 17. And, you know, unfortunately that wasn't abnormal for my family, for my community. Um, you know, there was still uh, 10 brothers and sisters. Every single one of us except for my brother had dropped out of high school. Um, my sisters were all young mothers, teenage mothers. Um, and so, frankly, there just wasn't a whole lot of uh, role models, positive people out there for me. And uh, it wasn't until my parole officer finally, for the first time, <laughs> treated me like a kid with problems instead of just a bad kid um, that I really started to feel like there was something else out there for me. So, so long story short, um, it gave me some vision myself. I ended up getting some more mentors, role models, GED, community college, uh, transferred out to USC in LA law school here in Vegas. I actually ran for the Nevada Assembly in my last year of law school, so I graduated, was elected, and sat for my bar during my first legislative session, and here I am running for Congress uh, about four or five years later. So it's been a long journey, uh, a very busy one, but I'm incredibly proud of where I come from, and frankly, I talk about it a lot, and, and also, you know, obviously one of the reasons uh, that I ultimately endorse Bernie um, is because of my personal experiences, is because of, um, uh, frankly, what he stands for and what I think I stand for as an elected official and as a candidate. Um, all of the experiences that I had and, frankly, the challenges that so many people in our country still to this day, so many young people in our country are experiencing. And, frankly, from the time that I was growing up in Northeast Las Vegas to the time that I was in college and had an experience with another young young person who reminded me so much of myself, things have gotten worse, not better, for many people, many families in this country. And so I, I just really firmly believe in not only his vision, but, but frankly, I, I talk a lot about that background because it also describes my inspiration for public service every day and my perspective as a policymaker. Wow. You know, listening to you, um, 
I had a chance to watch your TEDx um, presentation. Um, uh, I keep your eye on the prize, and yeah. it was such a compelling narrative of what you've been through. And you 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 did you condensed that <laughs> into a <laughs> small small portion of time. But um, it's that type of story that I think the average American. Um, kind of, you know, it's yours is unique and yours is yours, right? And and it's different than anyone else's. But there's so many people out here that are hurting, so many people who are going through these types of stories and, and challenges and struggles. And to see someone not only survive it but overcome it, I mean, I think that's so compelling that people really need to hear it so much more. I like that you connected that to Bernie Sanders. And looking at your platform and what you're fighting for, for uh, minimum wage increases, what you're fighting for, for the economy locally there in Nevada, tell me how, what was it? Two parts to this question. One, what was it beyond the, the parole officer that gave you a second chance? Um, and I encourage everyone to go watch, I um, keep an eye on the prize, TEDx with Lucy Flores, um, watch it. But beyond her, what, was there any type of economic help that came that actually or structure in place whether it was loans uh, anything that helped you that could be modeled to help somebody else I'll just stop with that one question absolutely well and again another reason why I ended up endorsing Bernie over Hillary it's not not because I think Hillary is a bad person or because I don't think that she would make a good president I think she would make a fine president in fact both of them both Bernie and Hillary would be infinitely better than any of the Republican choices so it, it wasn't because I, I you know it, it was up to the detriment of her it was because frankly Bernie's platform and his priorities align more so with my own vision and my own experiences. So when we talk about debt-free college, when we talk about free college, uh, the only reason, the only reason why I'm able to be here today is because one, I was able to go to community college for a year um, as a high school dropout, as someone with a GED for no cost for none whatsoever. When I transferred out to the University of Southern California, the reason why I was able to get there is because USC is a private institution. And on their website, I remember, I knew nothing about college. I knew nothing about university. I was trying to figure all of this out on my own. And I ran across their website that said, we meet 100% of every student's financial need. And the only thing I knew at the time was that I was pretty needy. So <laughs> I applied. And sure enough, I had no idea how I was going to pay for it. But they said. So uh, they ended up giving me twenty-four dollars to $26,000 a year in, in a grant, not in loans, not in uh, work study, in grants. And so I was able to graduate from USC with a very, very, very little amount of debt. Now, the story is different. Once law school comes around, I actually accumulated an enormous amount of debt, which right. is why I often say that why are we currently in a country where you can break the cycle of poverty and end up in a cycle of debt? All of that is just incredibly wrong. It, we're stunting our communities, our young people, our economy. And, and so for me, it really was a, you know, a, personal, a personal thing and personal experiences that I was able to educate myself. And I was able to you know, become something different than what I began as um, because I had those educational opportunities. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Uh, Noah, I wanted to throw it to you. I know you have some, um, some questions over there. First, I want to say, my lawyer sister, you took, you studied for the bar and was running for off the girl. I got to give you. <laughs> I'll do it for you. There you go. Well, let me let me get some extra claps because actually next month is my final payment for my bar loan. So oh. I'm really excited. I'm still paying mine off. So yes. <laughs> But no, seriously, I, I just, when I first read your statement, you know, your post on Facebook endorsing, but explaining your story, like, it resonated with me so much. Growing up in inner city New York and Chicago, um, single parent household, low income, going to law school with two small children, like, it, I identify with you so much, and I just wanted to thank you first and foremost, because... I mean, those personal accounts really resonate so much when we have people trying to depict him as, you know, this crazy mad scientist guy. Like, what he's talking about really speaks to 
to our issues that we're facing. And, and like you said, I mean, I too, you know, several siblings who have different issues and stuff, but they're coming around and coming out and people are engaging and motivated. So I was just wondering, not so much about Bernie so much, but with, with your experience in politics, like, there, there. We need more women of color. We need more women, but we also need more women of color. Women with our voices, you know, to get involved. Like, what, what advice, if any, would you have, you know, for young women, old women, you know, to get involved and to, to start to figure out how to navigate that process. Well, first and foremost is just to find something that really drives you, something that moves you, something that you're incredibly passionate about. And everybody has their own thing. It could be the environment. It could be animal rights. It can be education. It can be anything. Um, but if you're not in that, or, or a, a person, for example, um, the very first time that I actually got involved in politics was in, in Obama's campaign in 2008, and that wasn't that long ago. That was my very first time that I really got involved in any campaign, any kind of politics, any kind of movement. So, um, so it was from that process and think about it, that was the very first time as a young woman that I had gotten involved in politics and just two years later I ended up becoming one of the first Latina ever to be elected to the state legislature in the history of Nevada. So, you know, I, I mean the, the, the journey is different for everyone but you have to be there for the right reasons and you have to be motivated by something. And then the reason why that passion has to come from inside is because this is hard. This is difficult. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I don't post my some of my live interviews in advance is because the trolls have a strong game, and so in order for me to you love trolls, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I use the block button very liberally, um, and, and so you know, you're constantly criticized. You're you're constantly uh, attacked. You're constantly judged. Um, you know, you're you're constantly under uh, pressures and fundraising pressures, etc. There's a lot of things about politics that is distasteful to women, but ultimately, those positives outweigh the negatives when you can get into that office or get into that position and actually start accomplishing things for people. You know, the fact that that I can say that that it's because of me that we now have one of the most comprehensive domestic violence prevention laws in Nevada uh, based on VAWA, the, Vo the Violence Against Women Act. You know, the very first email that I got the day that law was implemented was from a young woman who essentially said that she had come across the, some media coverage on it. She had found out that she now had these rights that she didn't have before, um, emailed me to essentially say that because of me, I had probably saved her life. I, I mean, I can't tell you how moving. I cried that day, and I still, you know, get all emotional and thinking about it. But that's just one example of the ways in which right. you, as right. one person, can change your community, can change a state, can possibly change a country, and and those things make it worth it. Awesome. Yeah, it's, that's uh, this, that's that's before I, I I say my question is like in politics in general. What you just said is when someone can say that they have rights they didn't realize they had before, that's, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's the really important part of politics that's and why people should, should show why politics is so important. Like Bernie used the example of the kind of negative version of this, of, of his childhood, where someone, because someone won an election in Germany, most of his family died and millions of others died and his dad had to flee the country and come to America. And that was his lesson, he says as a child, that politics is serious business and you should always take it serious. What exactly. you just said is the positive version of that and it's, it is equally important and it's, it is just amazing to hear that. Um, I, guess, I guess my question would be on the youth, because um, I'm not a woman so I can't really talk on women's issues too in depth, but uh, I try sometimes, but I guess mainly the <laughs> There are a lot of young people who are calling themselves Sanders Democrats running for elections. And to tie this in, something Hillary said on March 1st that was kind of ignored by the media, where she was talking to a Somali girl, and I don't want to use this to bash her or anything, but when she was, this Somali girl was talking uh, about complaints she had with both Hillary Clinton and local politicians in her area, Hillary Clinton says, well, why don't you run for something as a kind of way to end the conversation? And... What I've seen as a response, I didn't like the way she answered, but I'm, I'm very pleased to see 
so many young progressives go not only for local office but national office. Um, what do you think that means going forward for this progressive movement to see our version of a populist congressional movement is bringing in so many young people and young voters and young organizers and young supporters? Well, I mean, I obviously think it's a very positive thing. Um, you know, look, I, I try not to be too judgmental about other people and, and campaigning, et cetera. Um, I, I was actually very disappointed in Hillary's response to that young lady as well. Um, you know, I feel like women are discouraged so often that to have that kind of interaction with possibly someone who she still at that point saw as a mentor role model, um, you know, might discourage her in the future to actually run despite, you know, her assertion that why don't you run. Uh, that being said, again, the pressures of campaigning, being exhausted, et cetera, sometimes people just have short tempers, et cetera. So, I mean, that's all that I'll say to that. I will say, however, that I do personally, and I can only tell you from my perspective as, as a legislator, as a, as a candidate, that I obviously go out of my way every single day, um, particularly with women and women of color, because I do know how hard it is in politics. So I go out of my way every day to encourage young ladies, um, to encourage women in general, to be supportive as I possibly can, um, to be as accessible as I possibly can. You know, one of my best friends in the world is Senator Nina Turner, who you guys are very familiar with. And her and I, we really bonded when we were running together statewide uh, in 2014. And, and you know, we were uh, leaning on each other's shoulders and uh, probably complaining a whole lot that, uh, that we should not never share in public. Um, but, you know, just having her be a, a, a sounding board for me we never talked all that often, but just being able to send that text, just being able to know that there were other women who understood what I was going through and vice versa, that is just, I can't tell you how valuable that is in the process. So I just personally try to lead by example um, and, and hopefully others will do the same. I want to read some comments from, um, like, I, like I do from our chat room and from Twitter. There's a lot of people listening and, and interacting. Um, the first one I want to read is from <clears throat> is from QNN, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, NCC. Um, she says that this is the kind of honesty, sincerity, and personal experience and growth people are looking for, uh, that people are looking at and hoping for in this election. Um, Digital83 said that you have an amazing story much like those of so many other Bernie surrogates. And she wanted to say, keep up the amazing work. You are truly an inspiration. Um, and then one more, uh, they said, and we can all, uh, actually, I'm going to skip that one. Let me go to this one. Um, Lucy Flores' struggle is real, and she has shown, she has grown to understand that it matters and to guide and help others. So these are just some of the comments and feedback that, um, that people are giving um, online and on Twitter. Um, they, they're really touched. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Like I, I, before I got into the negative world of politics, I was all into the inspirational uh, world and, and all the, and the motivational speaking, and, and I've heard a lot of speakers speak. And when I heard your TEDx um, your presentation, I was captivated. It's not really many times that I sit around for 15 minutes and just listen to a video straight. I don't even listen to my own videos for 15 minutes. <laughs> So you that's have saying something. Yeah, that's that, that's a compelling story, and I think a lot of people need to hear it uh, more. But we do deal in politics, so if you don't mind, if I, I can ask a few questions about your actual campaign and uh, going over there. So one thing I was um, I found that uh, was interesting is that um, previously uh, you were endorsed by um, by Harry Reid. And in this particular race, however, he's uh, opted to, to endorse someone else, uh, Senator Ruben um, Cahoon. And so my question to you is, um, are you, you're, are you, it seems like you're fighting an uphill battle uh, in terms of fundraising against um, establishment players. Um, I saw another candidate who looks like a, another Democratic candidate who looks like she's seriously funded. I believe her name is Susie. Yeah, I didn't write her name down completely. Oh, no, I did. Susie Lee. Um, she's heavily funded. You know, tell us about the fight that you're in politically and what is your path? What? How have you guys crafted out a path to victory and what does that look like? 
Well, first and foremost, I'm, I'm incredibly well positioned in this race because I'm the only person who, one, has spent a lifetime in this district. I have been uh, in, in this district since I was two years old, as I mentioned earlier. I'm the only person who's actually represented a portion of the district in the Nevada legislature, and I'm the only person who just came off of that statewide race. So my initial polling indicated that I was far, far ahead, and this was about a year ago when I decided to get in. I was 19 points ahead. Um, and that was largely due because lots of people know who I am. They've gotten to know me personally. They've gotten to know my story. They at least recognize my name. Um, I am a very, very hard worker. I spend a lot of time talking with people. If I could spend all of my time talking with just people, with voters, uh, rather than having to spend any time at all fundraising, I would, of course, do that. Um, but the realities, as you said, are are there. Um, so what what we have then been able to um, to work off of is that substantial base of support, that universe of support that exists out there in this entire district. I should also mention that I'm the only person who's been on the ballot in every single county in the entire district. Hmm. So we're hmm. already have an amazing lead. Now, as of a couple of weeks ago, I was endorsed by the three major progressive national organizations out there. Um, Democracy for America, MoveOn.org, which, by the way, I won with 64% of the vote from people in the district in a four-way race. Getting getting 50 plus one, the majority, right. in a four-way race is hard enough, but getting 64% we thought was pretty incredible. Um, and also the Progressive Campaign Change, the C Progressive Change Campaign Committee, the PTRIP. Um, so those three organizations have endorsed me. Um, so what they did is they actually polled and didn't tell us. That poll from just a couple of weeks ago indicates that we are now 20 points ahead despite collectively my opponent spending close to a half million dollars already, and every single one of them are still polling in the single digits. This primary race is three months out, so they, all of them, have um, an, enormous, um, an enormous bridge to span in a very short amount of time. That being said, because one is endorsed by, you know, the political establishment, he's managed to get um, political favors and, and labor endorsements and other things that have happened. I'm very proud, for example, of all of my endorsements because I've earned them. I didn't ask for any political favors. I didn't ask for any string pulling, um, particularly with MoveOn.org, where it was a vote of the members. And so we're incredibly proud of that support. Um, but, you know, once the, and, and the other candidate, as you mentioned, is a multimillionaire, um, has already put in $150,000 of her own money into this race. And uh, and so once she starts dumping on um, all of that money, those numbers are going to move. They they absolutely are. So we know that we're um, we're up against some tough competition, but we also know that we're very very much ahead, and we also know that we have this incredible base of support out there in the community. So as long as we are able to continue fundraising so that we can stay competitive, um, we and of course there isn't a harder worker out there. Um, we are feeling incredibly confident about how we're doing and uh, and where we're going come June 14th. Okay, I'm getting. The, I see a Noah in her arms, and uh, I'm getting all warm and fuzzy over here because it's the it's the what you're doing is exactly what we have been talking about on our end that needs to be done. You you're not a you're not a mass marketed candidate. You are a candidate who is from the area who knows the people, who knows the issues, the people know you, and because of that, despite the uh, campaign, um, the fundraising advantage that your opponents have, you still have this competitive edge that they don't have, and they quite frankly, in my opinion, they won't be able to buy. You have a model that I think really needs to be um, replicated across the country for progressives that someone who knows the people, someone who knows the issues, that may not have half a million dollars to run, but has millions of dollars worth of connections with the community can come out and really bring it to not only the establishment, but bring it on behalf of the people. So um, I really applaud Absolutely. what you're doing. I, I am well, a fan of what you're doing. And what I always say is that we can, we, we absolutely can win. We don't have to be. The number one fundraiser in this race is not going to be the winner. 
the person who has enough to compete and is the hardest worker is going to be the winner. So yeah. don't get me wrong, fundraising is absolutely important, and uh, and and you know these small dollar contributions in the way that I've been raising money, I can now you know for example that my multimillionaire point, uh, opponent um, was trying to get to 1,000 individual contributors at the end of January. At the end of January, I was crossing the 3,000. Wow. Mark. I'm now at 5,500. So, you know, obviously um, what Bernie has really been able to, I think in my opinion, really re revolutionize the way that some of us uh, progressive candidates who don't have that establishment money behind us are still able to be competitive because people are realizing that, you know, their three and five dollars does make a difference. If enough people come together, if enough people, you know, if, if three and a half million of Bernie supporters all sent me one dollar, we would be set. <laughs> you know, so all I need is a fraction of those folks to send me a couple dollars and and we're in good shape. And and we've been in good shape now. You know, we've we've done relatively well with our fundraising um, despite those challenges. We're working on that, by the way. We're we'll get you. <laughs> I, I work with the <laughs> Bernie subreddit. I think you did an AMA with them. Uh, I did, so yes. It was really them. great. Us and some outside groups, we have some fundraising projects, and we're going to do our best to help with that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have one. Like, actually, you know what? We've we've held you. We've held you long enough. I, and I know you have you have a long day ahead of you tomorrow, as is every day in your profession. Um, I want to thank you, Lucy, so much for taking the time to come on. Um, we we have to have you back so that we can ask all the other questions that are that are coming flooding in right now. And we have people calling in wanting to, to probably speak to you. But I, I don't want to belabor the hour too long for you. I do want to ask you to do this one last thing for us. Tell them where they can go and um, to support you uh, financially. What they can do what what is it that you need the most from this progressive army that we're building here how can we push you forward well you can get more information and you can find my act blue account at my website lucyflores.com um, you know outside of fundraising here in Nevada um, the outpouring of support has been absolutely incredible um, I, I made a comment to uh, some media earlier today that uh, it's been really awesome because I haven't had to do any outreach whatsoever for volunteers. People are flocking to the campaign, and so um, later on in the future, here shortly in the next couple of weeks, we'll have virtual phone bank opportunities as well. So even if you're not in Nevada and you can't uh, volunteer, you can do so virtually. Um, but I would say first and foremost, we do have an important uh, FEC uh, deadline coming up on the 31st of March. And so if you do have a couple dollars to spare, um, you can please go to lucyflores.com and, and do that contribution there. It absolutely adds up and it has made such a significant difference in this campaign. Lucy, and, I and, I, and I'll, and I'll also, also say that um, I'm more, as you can tell, I love talking <laughs> with people, so I'm more than happy to answer a question if you'd like, um, but but I would love to come back. I'd love the opportunity to, uh, to keep talking some more about the issues. Well, far be it from me to uh, oblige you. If you want to answer a question, let me, let me read this last question uh, okay. from the chat room. Since you love to talk and I love to hear you talk, let's do this. <laughs> um, this is from Digital I H wish everybody said that. <laughs> you know? Um, Digital 83 said, what other issues um, like the Colombian trade agreement or, or the coup in Honduras are Latinos fo focusing on in this uh, race? We hear so much about immigration, but what else is a focus of importance for uh, the Latino community? I always say Latino issues are American issues. Um, yes, unfortunately, the media loves to focus on immigration just for the Latino community, but the Latino community Look, so many people, including the immigrant community, um, they're just looking for a better opportunity for themselves and for their kids than possibly they had. Um, that is just an American value. And frankly, um, the reason why Bernie is doing as well as he is with the Latino demographic is because he is his message is resonating because those issues are what are most important to this community. We're talking about better jobs. We're talking about access to education for their kids. We're talking about access to affordable college education. Um, you know, all of health care, etc. Social security. Um, I, I always tell a story of my dad um, because he worked day and night 
almost his entire life, literally, day and night. He was a gardener by day. He was a musician at night. And this, to this day, um, he retired later. He took that, that later choice. He tries to survive off of $500 a month on Social Security. Nobody can do that. And, and if it weren't for his kids who help him, where would my dad be? There are millions of senior citizens who are in that same position and, of course, millions of Latinos who are in that same position. So that's why I always say that you know, Bernie's message and this progressive agenda that we're all working towards, it cuts across gender, race, um, sexual orientation, religion, etc. This is something that affects all of us, and so for the Latino community, um, it really is those same issues. And 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 frankly, um, you know, again, you know, I, I I kind of keep bringing it back to Bernie, but but also for myself because we do share so much of those same values and the same vision and the same priorities um, for this community. You know, I think something that I haven't seen but we need to see sooner than later. I, I think Bernie Sanders needs to get you, uh, Nina Turner, uh, <laughs> Portia Bolger, Molly Grover, and get you guys, people like you who are so dynamic because there is so much, and I'm sorry, I forgot uh, Noah Chonga. She definitely has to be there, my co-host. <laughs> uh, you guys need to just get on stage and just talk and talk about whatever it is that is pertinent for that moment and just open your mouths and just let the nation hear the type of dynamic women, human beings that are supporting Bernie Sanders, but not just for the sake of Bernie Sanders, but for the sake of, of all of what you guys are doing because I don't think enough people have heard your voice and we wanna amplify it as much as we can. So I'm gonna get with Solomon and Solomon, we're gonna get with the subreddit and the subreddit is gonna, get, we're gonna work the channels and somebody needs to that together because I haven't seen it but with you uh, Nina Anoa Portia and Molly with all of that on one stage and more oh my goodness I don't I don't think that there's a person in team Hillary <laughs> well anyway it's not about that but I don't think there's anybody in team Hillary who would want to be on that stage with you guys so listen uh, Lucy um, I have another person who said that they can listen to you all day I honestly <laughs> We can talk all day. I do want to ask you about just that human element of of finding that place where where you were able to turn that switch. Um, you and I, we're we're pretty much the same age, and um, we've had um, similar paths, um, but for different reasons. And and there's this um, there's this 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 fight that's inside of you, and this talent that's inside of you that is above average. But there's some people who who don't have the skill set that you have or the skill set that I have that are able to break away from the cycle that we found ourselves in. And so the human question that I want to ask you, uh, and then I promise you this will be the last question, is what and how can we take the opportunities that are really only here for people who are extra, extra, extra hardworking or extra, extra talented or just extra lucky, how do we take that and bring it down to a person who isn't born super talented, who isn't born super lucky, and who, who may not have the hardest work ethic, but how do we get these opportunities so that other people can break out of that cycle that you broke out of? It's a big question, it's ambiguous, but I just want you to talk about that. Well, I mean, look, a, a lot of this is, it requires systemic change, and, and so, I mean, this is, you know, obviously what, what I think of every single day, and how can I make my little dent in this world, and, and how can I throw that pebble into the lake and, and have it reverberate with way will back others, right? And then how do we combine that together to actually create a movement to change um, the the situation that so many people are in? Um, I, I don't think that there's one answer to that, and, and I don't think that there's one person with one answer. So I think that I always go back to, look, you never know the impact that you can have on someone else's life simply by sharing a kind word, simply by um, uh, perhaps uh, giving, a, you know, making a contribution to a, a, a local uh, organization. I mean, it could be so many different things, right? For me, I always say my parole officer never envisioned that I would be where I am. I never envisioned that I would be where I am. But she looked at me like a kid. 
and she had the opportunity to revoke my parole. That was the moment where I realized that I needed to do something different, that I could possibly have the opportunity to do something different. I was sitting in that courtroom in my orange jumpsuit, in my body shackles, with my wrists and my legs and, and my belly chain, and I was seriously convinced that my life was over. But when she told the judge that she was recommending that I be released to the custody of my father as opposed to revocation of my parole, that literally changed the outcome of my life. And I'm sure that she did not think that it would have the impact that it did. And to this day, if you talk with her, she says that she was just doing her job. So what I would say is that just for every individual out there who's listening, you never know when you will change the outcome of someone's life. And, and that's all that we can do. I, I got to I got to No, Solomon, stop. No, no. Leave it, <laughs> leave it there. Drop the mic. Go ahead, Solomon. Go ahead. Go ahead, Solomon. There's, no, 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 no. Stop, stop. No, Solomon. No, we got to leave. <laughs> oh, I just, oh. Uh, Lucy, oh, my goodness. Please come back. Please. Uh, we want to hear you talk more. Please do I'm more. I'm happy to. Please speak more. Just talk to the people because I one thing my grandfather told me that didn't come true until I until a year ago. He said if they hear you, you've got it. Anybody that hears you, you've got them. So just talk as much as you can, and I know you'll be so successful. So thank you so much for joining Doing us. Doing our best. Thank you, Lucy Flores. Listen, I want I want everybody. When that digital phone banking comes up, I want you to, um, everyone listening, I want you to go to her site and phone bank digitally. Uh, if you can afford to give something, you have a little extra money after you pay all of your bills, send some money her way. We need voices like this in, um, in Congress. My, my problem, <clears throat> I'm, getting, I'm getting into some commentary, so if I, I might say some things that you guys might have to disavow later, so I'll just give you as that warning, uh, as the trigger warning. <laughs> um, my, my, my problem with this whole thing is um, a person like this should be the person that the establishment says, we need this type of voice. Let's elevate this voice. Let's, let's take this voice and push them into Congress. Because I I researched you know I researched her 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 opponents I went to all their websites um, I, I saw what they stood for I listened if they had audio if they had video I listened to it and and I'm telling you Lucy is the person to run and win that seat and I for the life of me cannot tell you why in on green earth they would pick someone else to be the anointed one from the Democratic Party. You know why? Because I think some of the judgment has, there's there's a lapse of judgment happening uh, in the establishment, which is why you actually have this insurgency that's fighting back against the establishment, because the establishment is not making the right decisions anymore. Lucy is the right decision for that district. No questions asked. Maybe Harry Reid is just getting old in his old, you know, and that, no, 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 he's, he's losing wisdom in his old age. Instead of gaining wisdom in his old age, it seems like he may be losing wisdom because I just don't see uh, the guy that he picked being anywhere remotely as impactful for humanity <laughs> as, as Lucy. Uh, listen, I have a caller who has been so patient. Um, caller, you're live on the air. What's your name, comment, and or question? 